your glory fill this house pour it out let your love run over here and now let your glory fill this house oh, fill this house God
Let the heavens proclaim your word. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels to sing your praise. Jesus, King of all the earth. Let the heavens proclaim your word. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels to sing your praise.
brought me out of darkness You have filled me with peace Giver of mercy You're my help in time of need Lord, I can't help but sing faithful
love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you guys turn around, say hello to one another. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. It's good to have you with us. We hope that you all have a safe New Year as we prepare for uh, another decade and finishing up this one. As we sang this morning, God's been faithful, hasn't he, to all his promises? And uh, it's good to serve a God that keeps his word to us. And uh, I know he's been faithful to us. Uh, myself personally and my family and uh, this church over the years and um, we're grateful to continue this journey that we're on with the Lord and him showing his continued faithfulness to us. I want to welcome you to Calvary Chapel this morning especially if you're here for the first time or visiting us from uh, another Calvary, maybe you're visiting from another state or you're visiting your families in the area. Uh, I know there's still some folks traveling and some that have come back from long journeys. And so uh, we're glad to see you all here this morning. If anybody needs a Bible this morning, we do have uh, gentlemen that were, are coming up and down the aisles and they'll be happy to put a Bible in your hand. If you need one, you forgot yours at home or you don't own a Bible, we want you to be able to hear the word as well as to see it with your own eyes. And so uh, keep your hand up and there's a few uh, guys coming around. If you need one, uh, lift your hand up. And if you don't own a Bible, uh, please accept that as a gift from us this morning. We want you to have uh, a copy of the scripture so you could read them. It's one of the ways, the chief ways that God has revealed himself to us is through the scriptures. A uh, couple of announcements real quickly is uh, our home groups are, are going to resume meeting 
next Wednesday, uh, January 8th, beginning that week, uh, will be uh, our home groups resuming meeting after uh, the Christmas and New Year's holidays. And so not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, January 8th, the home groups will resume. Uh, I also want to meet with all those that are going to Israel with us in 2020 in February. Uh, on January 12th, after the service on Sunday, uh, I would love to have a brief meeting with all of those that are going to Israel with us and just to be able to uh, answer any questions that you might have and fill you in on any uh, new information that has been coming in. And so uh, mark your calendars for those going to Israel with us. January 12th, we'll gather shortly after our Bible study in the morning. Uh, tonight, Sunday night, prayer is canceled. And so uh, no prayer tonight. And we'll uh, hopefully resume that next Sunday evening. Um, if you have your Bibles, would you open up with me to our memory verse of the month this December? We've uh, been looking together at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. I would like to read that with you this morning. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. And if you would do me a favor and read that aloud back uh, with me, and we'll read it together. And if you uh, are reading from any other Bible translation other than the New King James Version, you could follow along on the screen uh, behind me, and uh, I'll be reading from the New King James Version as well. Now let's say it together, beginning with verse uh, 6, 1 Peter chapter 5. Notice what Peter writes. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Can we do that one more time louder so I could hear you? Let's try it again. Ready? First Peter 5, verse 6 and 7. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Amen. First Peter 5, 6, and 7. Well, I would like to dismiss the young people at this time. Uh, young people, middle schooler and high schoolers, you're welcome to head to your class this morning. And if you would have uh, in your Bibles, if you want to turn there with me to 1 Corinthians Chapter 5 this morning is where we're going to be studying from. And if you would do me a favor and stand with me, we'll read it, our text together this morning from 1 Peter chapter 5. And we'll try to look at the whole chapter this morning, Lord willing. If not, we'll pick up next week. We'll see how the Lord works. Are you guys excited to be here this morning? It's good to have you guys with us this morning. I'm, hopefully you got everything you wanted for Christmas, and if not, you already had Jesus, and that's all we need, right? Well, I've entitled the message this morning, How to Handle a Scandal. Notice what Paul writes to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, Paul continues, and he says what? It is actually reported... Turn on my timer here so I don't go over my time. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. That a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up. And have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you. For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ... Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved 
in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for your eternal truths. Lord, we know that there is nothing new under the sun. The same things that were happening in Corinth happen today. And Father, they are a warning to us. They are an example to us to obey your word and to take heed to the counsel of the Holy Scripture this morning. We pray, Lord, that as we search the Scripture this morning, that the Scripture would search our hearts, that your truth, Father, would search our heart, that we might expel from our own hearts anything that doesn't honor you, that doesn't please you, that is in disagreement and contrary to your word this morning. Lord, we know that this is a heavy subject to cover, and I ask your help. I ask that you would speak through me, that you would speak to our hearts individually and corporately as a church this morning. Speak to us now by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated this morning. <clears throat> Seattle, Washington newspaper reported this article, and I quote, it says, a man who tried to siphon gasoline from a motorhome got a mouthful of sewage instead, police said. Police got an early morning call from the owners of the vehicle parked on Seattle Street. When the officers arrived, they found sewage and what looked like vomit on the ground. Nearby, they found a man curled up very ill next to the vehicle. The police spokesman said that the man had admitted he was trying to steal some gas and plugged his hose into the motor vehicle's sewage tank by mistake. The motorhome's owner from Bellingham, Washington, declined to press charges in last week's indictment, calling it the best laugh he had ever had. <laughs> Sin stinks, doesn't it? And church, we need to learn that lesson. That sin stinks. It not only stinks up the church corporately, but our testimonies, our lives personally. And this is what Paul is emphasizing in this chapter, chapter 5, as we just read. But we've been gone for a couple weeks from 1 Corinthians, and I just want to briefly just look over in a recap what we've covered or what this book, this letter of 1 Corinthians is all about. The church at Corinth, in the city of Corinth, there in what is modern-day Greece, was a very problematic church. Paul planted the church. He established the church. He spent 
18 months there ministering to the people in Corinth and he established a group of believers by preaching the gospel to them. The first 11 chapters, Paul is primarily correctively correcting the problems in the church. The last five chapters 12 through 16 are instructive, and so primarily it's a corrective letter that Paul was writing. Problems in the church were happening such as divisions within the church. Some were saying, I am of team Apollos, and they were following this uh, gifted teacher named Apollos. Or some would say, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Peter, and others would say, I'm of Jesus. Other problems in the church were happening, such as spiritual pride, where they thought that they had arrived. And yet Paul diagnosed them as being carnal. We get the word carne or fleshly. In other words, they were ruled by the appetites of their flesh and not ruled by the Holy Spirit of God. In chapters 3 and 4, we saw Paul defining for them what true spirituality looks like as begin to contrast what the Corinthians look like in com comparison to the true apostles and in Paul's own life and his faithfulness and also his heart to serve and also his stewardship in, in the ministry that God has given to him and being a manager of the gifts and the talents, the time and his own life that God had given to him. And so they were also a church that was suing each other, brother taking brother to court. Instead of handling matters within and loving and forgiving each other, they were taking each other to court. And they were also a church that was getting drunk at the communion table when they would gather as a church. They were a very gifted church. However, they were drawing attention to themselves rather, rather than giving glory to God. They had the wrong motive and they were out of order. And Paul will address all these issues here in the letter of Corinthians. But today, notice in our text, as we just read, Paul addresses a great problem, not only in Paul's day, but in our day today, the problem of sexual immorality in the church. And so if you're a note taker, we're going to look at four things this morning. The first thing I want to draw your attention to is the problem in the church. Notice verse 1 again. Paul says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And so notice how Paul begins. He says, it is actually reported among you that there is sexual immorality among you in the church. It's interesting that the word reported here actually in the Greek means to be wholly or utterly known. We today might say, you know, that, that this was the talk of the town. It was reported all over town. It was probably, you know, on every tabloid. You go to the supermarket there. Every tabloid, hey, this is what's happening in the church at Corinth. The news reporters live were reporting and showing the face of the guy in the church who was sleeping with his, his stepmom. You could imagine this was happening. Everybody and their grandmother knew about this. It was highly reported. And it was such a serious offense, Paul says, that not even the world, the Gentiles, you know, had this happening amongst them. They even saw it as offensive that there was a young man who had an ongoing sexual relationship with his father's wife. Most scholars say that it wasn't his mom, but most likely his stepmom. Talk about a cougar, right? The real housewives of Corinth. 
If you've ever read Romans chapter one, you know, I mean, Paul tackles a lot of sexual immorality and perversion there in Romans chapter one. But what's interesting to me is that when Paul wrote Romans chapter one, he was looking out of his window from the city of Corinth. He was in Corinth when he wrote Romans chapter 1. Corinth was the inspiration for Paul's portrait of perversion. And here we read about it. That there was sexual immorality in the church at Corinth. And by the way, the word sexual immorality, if you're a Bible scholar, the Greek word is the word pornea. If that sounds familiar, it's where we get the English word pornography. It's often translated in the Bible as fornication. Originally, the word pornea referred to specifically going to a prostitute, but it has come to include any kind of extramarital sexual relationship outside of the covenant bonds of marriage, as God has designed it between one man and one woman. It includes homosexuality, incest, bestiality, fornication, which is sex uh, without a marriage covenant. It includes adultery, which is sex outside of, you know, with somebody other than your spouse. And this is uh, what Paul is talking about here. Sexual immorality. God calls it a sin. And every sin is against God and against the holiness of God. And I think that you and I together as a church and individually as believers in Jesus Christ need to take a warning from the scriptures this morning. Don't think that you're above this temptation. Oh, but pastor, I'm in my 50s. Oh, I'm 60. I'm 70. Listen, David the king was 50 years old when he saw Bathsheba bathing and called her to his palace to sleep with her and commit adultery and then try to hide her pregnancy by killing her husband. The term dirty old man doesn't exist for nothing. We need to watch out. We need to be careful. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. It should have been enough that the Bible had already declared this as a sin deserving of death. In Leviticus 18, verse 8, Deuteronomy 22, verse 30, Deuteronomy 27, verse 20. And not only that, it should have been enough that the culture itself was shocked that this was happening in the church. But the Corinthian Christians didn't seem to be bothered by it at all. And that's what Paul addresses in verse 2. Notice, I think Paul might have been more shocked at the proud approval of that sinning brother than the sin itself. Notice verse 2, Paul goes on and he says what? And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might, might be taken away from among you. The word puffed up in the original language means to be arrogant or proud. It's found seven times in the entire New Testament, six times in the book of Corinthians alone. This church was a proud and puffed up church. I love what Chuck Swindoll says in his commentary. Listen, he says they had been inflated with a destructive view of grace. Salvation in Christ, they thought, permitted believers to do whatever they wanted. Instead of this arrogant approach to sin, they should have rather mourned as one might mourn at a funeral over the death of a loved one. He goes on here, the loss is not of a person's life, but of the church's purity. They had allowed this sin, this defilement in the church, and it was defiling the purity of the church, the holiness of the church. 
The word mourn that Paul uses here actually literally speaks of somebody that is grieving over the loss of a loved one. That was the attitude that this church should have been taking. You and I know that I've lost a loved one, a mom, a dad, a brother, a grandmother, a grandfather. We know what it means to mourn over the loss of a loved one. In the same way, spiritually, when a brother or sister falls, when a pastor or a pastor's wife, the worship leader, whoever it might be in the church, when somebody falls into sin, man, it should grieve our heart. It should break our hearts. And I know I've had pastors that are friends of mine or pastors from afar that I've respected very highly, that I've heard the news that they have fallen into some sin. They've lost their marriages. They lost their ministries. And it broke my heart. And it should break our hearts. And this is what Paul is addressing here because these people were not broken in their hearts. Instead, they were puffed up. They were proud that they had received this brother in, in his continual unrepentant sin. And they were boasting. And, and it reminds me of the church today, church. Because how many times do we hear of churches today that open their doors and say, hey, you're welcome to come in here, unrepentant sinners that call yourself Christian. You could be a Christian homosexual. Or a Christian, whatever, transgender, and all these things that the Bible says are, are sin and that you need to change your behavior. And the church claims what? We're tolerant. And we're more loving and we're more gracious. Hey, we're open-minded. We're compassionate. And what is happening is that the church and so-called Christians are going soft on sin. There are churches that aren't even preaching or even will mention sin anymore. And yet we know that God was not soft on sin. All we need to do is look at the cross of Jesus Christ to know that God was not soft on sin. He allowed his son to be punished and brutally beaten. Why? Because of sin. So that our sin could be forgiven. So that our sin could be done away with. Don't stop ever believing in what the Bible says, church. Read your Bibles. We need to stand firm on the unchanging, everlasting foundation of the Word of God. Hey, the times may change, but the Word of God never changes. It's going to stand true to the end. Don't Start preaching the world's philosophy over and above what the Word of God says. And let me pose this question before you this morning. How do you handle or treat cancer that has infected your body? Do you pet it? Oh, my little cancer. Hi, cancer. Oh, good morning, cancer. What do you want to eat today? You take it to the coffee shop and, you know, you, what do you want? You know, what do you want, cancer? No, you, you cut it out as fast as you can before it spreads to the rest of your body. And what Paul is telling us this morning is that this particular believer who is unrepentant of his sin is like a cancer in the church that's going to spread. And so notice, secondly, beginning with verse 3, he gives the prescription for the diagnosis of this cancer. In verse 3, he says, notice, for I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. Verse 4, notice what he says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, in the character of Jesus Christ, in all that Jesus Christ is and stood for and stands for, he says, when you gather together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says what? Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Notice this, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. 
And so Paul begins, notice, he says, hey, I've already judged this matter. Why had he already judged it? Because the word had already judged it. In Leviticus, in Deuteronomy, the word had already condemned it. God, through his revealed word, had already condemned it. And so we should already have a stance of where we stand with this particular sin, as Paul did. He said, I've already judged it. In the name of Jesus Christ, when you gather together. And then, you know, when we think about Jesus, we, we know that, that he hated sin. He went to the cross in order to wash away our sin. The book of Hebrews said that, that Jesus loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. And we know that he had a heart and a compassion for the sinner. He said, I came not to call the righteous, but the, the sinners to repentance, to change and, and to turn. He also had a gentleness and a restoration as a goal for the sinner to bring him into a right relationship with God. And this was Paul's goal here. That the, the spirit, the soul of this man would be saved in the end. There were certain uh, decisions that they needed to make regarding this particular person in the church. And it's what we call today church discipline. Just like in your family, you have family discipline or child discipline. When they do wrong, you spank them. God gives us instructions on how to properly spank a sinning brother or sister. And this is Paul's counsel. He tells us, notice, because it was a public matter, notice that he's telling the church here, when you gather together as a congregation, you need to call out this brother and you need to disfellowship with him. That's what they're saying. You need to excommunicate with him because he's unrepentant. Now, I'm sure they've probably already covered all the, you know, the, the steps of Matthew 18, Jesus' counsel of a sinning brother. That when you hear of your brother that sinned, is in sin, you go and you alone go and try to get your, your brother to confess his sin and to turn and to repent of his sin. If he doesn't hear you, then take somebody else with you, another brother. And if they don't hear together, all of you, then take it to the church leadership. And then if they don't hear the church leadership, they said what? Consider him an unbeliever as one, you know, that's out in the world. He doesn't want to serve God. He doesn't want to live right. And, and this is what Paul is coming to now. It's not a private matter. The world knows about it. Everybody in Corinth knows about it. And Paul is saying that it needs to be confronted publicly. Call him out. Let the church know what you're going to do to stay away from this brother. Now, not all sin is dealt with. Private sin should be dealt with privately. As we mentioned, Matthew 18, go with, with yourself to that brother. But it becomes when it becomes more public, it needs to be a, a public a discipline. And Paul's protecting the church in this area. Listen to what he said in 1 Timothy 5.20. He said, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. He not only had the whole church in mind when he was uh, telling Timothy here regarding church discipline, but he wanted the rest of the body to know, hey, don't do it. Don't publicly, you know, flaunt your sin because you're going to get rebuked. You're going to get corrected. And notice what he tells the church to do. He says what? In verse 5, turn him over to Satan. What does that mean? He's referring to, to what we just said. Turn him over to the world. Turn him over to the realm of the world where Satan is the God of this world. Don't allow him in your fellowship anymore. That's what he's saying. Excommunicate, disfellowship. You guys have heard of the right hand of fellowship? Well, there's also a left foot of disfellowship. When somebody doesn't want to obey or walk with God. Paul is telling them, this unrepentant sinner, don't let him, him, don't let him enjoy the wickedness of his sin and the fellowship of the body of Christ. And the purpose, of course, is that it's going to pollute the church. 
and you got to get him out. Don't fellowship with him anymore. Notice the second half of verse 5, the purpose of, of, of ex-fellowshipping him and, and excommunicating him was for the destruction of the flesh. It's speaking of his fleshly appetites, whatever you know, sexual appetites that he had uh, out of control. It's to destroy that area of his life that he's struggling with sin, with sin. That's what it's talking about, that his soul would be saved or his spirit would be saved ultimately. Listen to what David Guzik says. He says, this man, though a Christian, was at this time given over to the sins of the flesh. And Paul says that as they put him out, the man will be given over to the sinful consequences of his flesh. And the hope is that by wallowing in the results of his sin, the sinful impulse of the flesh in this particular area will be destroyed. You see, God sometimes will give you over to your flesh if you want to indulge in the flesh. You have a problem with pornography, sexual immorality, you want to sleep with a lot of people. And yet, the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you and warning you over and over and over again, and you don't want to listen. And God will give you over to that. Your free will, it's your choice. You want to ruin your marriage, ruin your testimony, whatever it is. Hey, then God will allow you to do that. Why? So you will ultimately wake up one day like the prodigal son, right? Right? And say, man, I blew it. What am I doing here? What was I thinking? I got this disease now, this sexually transmitted disease, no marriage, no job, no fellowship amongst the brothers. And you'll wake up, hopefully, and come crawling back into the church, repentant and broken. That's what God is saying here. Let him go. Let him go into the world. Don't fellowship with them anymore. And Jesus illustrated that with the, the prodigal son. I want my, you know, my inheritance now, dad. And he went out and lived it up. And, he, and when he wasted it, he was sleeping with the pigs ultimately. And he said, man, I had it better in my father's house. And he came back and the father was there waiting for him, as we should be waiting for the, the sinner that comes and that needs the mercy and the grace and the love and the forgiveness of God. Sometimes God will allow that. We see the, the example in the nation of Israel when they're going through the wilderness, right? And God provided the manna, the bread from heaven, but they got tired of the manna waffles, the banana bread, right? The manna burgers. They said, we want meat. And God said, okay, I'll give you quail. And he sent a bunch of quail. It was like stuck in their mouth. They had so much quail. They didn't know what to do with it. But Psalm 106, 15 says he gave them their desire, but he sent leanness into their soul. There's always a consequence for giving into the flesh, giving into sin. Galatians 6, 7, and 8, Paul says, God is not mocked. What a man sows, that he will also reap. If you want to sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. But if you want to sow to the spirit, you'll reap everlasting life. And the whole purpose, notice the goal, was that his flesh would be destroyed. He would get fed up with his flesh, but that his soul would be saved in the very end. And how many of us, you know, we look back at maybe this decade or even just this year, and we say, man, it's been a tough year. Battling temptation or battling this sin or that sin or trying to establish a prayer life or a devotional life. And we say, man, 2020, oh, man, I'm going to turn a new leaf. I'm fed up with the flesh. I want the spirit of God to rule in my life. How many of us are fed up with that? Because this man wasn't fed up yet. And he wanted to give into the flesh. And sometimes, you know, when you give them up and you disfellowship with them, you know, it takes a while before they come around again. Or they just go to another church and nobody knows about them. And they start saying, oh, poor me, my other church kicked me out. And, you know, they treated me bad and stuff like that. And, and nobody knows really why. 
the sins that they were involved in, the disobedience and the impurity that they brought, the defilement to the church. And we need to be careful. It doesn't mean that we stop practicing these principles because they're here for a purpose. Not only for the good of the sinner, but for the good of the church. Notice thirdly, in verse 6, Paul's going to begin to emphasize the purpose is not just for the the believer's salvation, but for the purity of the church. Notice verse 6. He says what? Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so the purpose here, Paul is saying now, is for purity, for holiness. He's saying, don't you know that all it takes is just a little bit of yeast or leaven? to be added to a fresh batch, a new batch of dough, and it'll spread throughout that whole batch of dough. Leaven in the scriptures often is a picture of sin. And all it takes, church, is just a little bit of sin that we introduce to our life or that we allow in the church, and it could spread. People think that, oh, we we must approve of that sin then. You know, pastor never talks about it, but, but yet, what does it say in the Word of God? What does the Bible say? All it takes is a little sin, and it affects everybody around us. Remember Achan in the book of Joshua? When in that first battle of Jericho, God said all the, the loot and the booty, everything that you get from this victory is going to be dedicated to the Lord. But Achan saw something in a tent, a wedge of gold, and I think some garments, and he took them for himself. And then when Israel went to the next battle, it was even a smaller battle, and, and there was some defeat. There were some lives that were lost. And God told Joshua, it's because there's sin in the camp. One person. And it affected all the the nation of Israel. That's all it takes, church. One person, whether it's the pastor, the worship leader, usher, or just anybody coming in here that thinks that, hey, eh, I'm just going to be a sinner. I'm going to hold on to this sin. And, And we bring that pollution with us. There's a great book. It actually deals specifically with the sin of sexual misconduct in the church and amongst the leadership of the church. And it's called The Stain That Stays by John Armstrong. Great book if you want to add it to your library about sexual immorality in the church. Be careful. All it takes is just a little sin. I love the passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1, emphasizing the smallness of what can putrefy and stink up our testimony. Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 10, 1, and he says what? As dead flies putrefy the perfumer's ointment and cause it to give off a foul odor, so does a little folly to one respected for wisdom and honor. That's all it takes is a little fly. A little, a little sin in your life that we allow. And it'll stink up your testimony. And your life and my life, we're supposed to be what? The fragrance of Christ. Wherever we go, right? We're, we're spraying the fragrance of Christ. People know there's something different about us and it's Jesus. But when we start allowing these little things in our life that we think, ah, it's a little thing. Oh, it'll be okay. I'll be okay. It's not going to take control over my life. But yet, you know, Solomon says here, it's going to stink up your life. Would you ever buy a a perfume bottle with a couple dead flies in there and give it to your loved one? Heck no. She'll throw it right back at you, right? Better start dodging that stuff. Neither does God want those things in our life. As we worship him, as we love on him. 
Somebody said it, it takes just one hole in a tire to stop the entire, entire car. Just one F on a test can lower your whole GPA. Oh, how about this, church? One penalty, one interception, one bad call can blow the entire team's chance for victory or championship. Just one little thing. Oh, man, if only he would have, you know, regret. One little thing. And so Paul, what is he illustrating here? The whole feast of Passover and the feast of unleavened bread that follow. The, the day before Passover was called the day of preparation. The household went throughout the whole house to remove all the leaven. Because remember, the original Passover in the book of Exodus was, a, was to be eaten. The meal was to be eaten in haste. They didn't have time to wait for the yeast to rise in the dough. No, there was to be a flat bread, no yeast. It was a symbol of the bread, Jesus Christ, unleavened, without sin. He, of course, was the Passover lamb, sacrificed for our sin. And it speaks of not only the salvation, the blood that preserves us, but how our life should be after the unleavened bread. Paul says, you are unleavened. And in Jesus Christ, how does he see us now that we're in Christ? He sees us as righteous. He sees us as holy. And what Paul is saying here is you need to be as you are, as God sees you, as God has called you to be holy. See, he, he doesn't just want his church to be a saved church. He wants us to be a holy church. He wants us to be not just a forgiven people, but a holy people. And positionally, in Christ Jesus, you and I, the believer in Jesus Christ, positionally, we stand as righteous in Christ Jesus. Even though practically we're a mess, positionally, through our faith in Jesus Christ, we are holy and we are righteous. And this is what Paul is saying here. Stop giving your life over to sin. Romans chapter 6, the, Paul says what? That, that the power of sin has been broken over your life. Stop giving your members over to be slaves of sin. The victory's already been won. We fight from victory, the spiritual warfare, not for victory. The battle's already been won over Satan, over the power of sin. You don't have to say yes to it anymore. That's what the Holy Spirit is all about. He's been given to us. He's the Holy Spirit so that we could live a holy life and we could say yes to holy living and no to our sin. And that's what Jesus is saying. You know, I, I, I have a few books in my library at home and are stacked up all in a particular place on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And there's two passages that are special to me. And one, one of them is, is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 where Paul tells us, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And in order for my mind to remember it, there's another one that says, don't quench the Spirit. And so I've come up with this phrase, don't GQ the spirit. Don't grieve and quench. In order for my mind to remember the grieving and the quenching, I don't, I don't want to sin against the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be this brother in the church that is an object of God's chastening hand and discipline. I want the blessing of God upon my life. I want his grace and his favor to continue to flow in my heart. I don't want to be the source that is stinking up this church and be and clogging the flow, you know, where the spout, where all the blessings come out because of my sin. I want to walk rightly with the Lord. And that's what Paul is saying here. Man, give this brother up so that the, the church could be pure. Remember, those of you that have studied the book of Acts with us in the home groups in Acts chapter 5, how valuable is holiness to the church for God. He took out Ananias and Sapphira, remember, when they tried to insert hypocrisy and unholiness and lying and deception into the church. He took them out. He modeled that church discipline for us. 
and he took them out. We need to be careful. We need to value it just as much as God does. And let me just share with you, I, I've got five minutes, okay? Let me just share with you, as a pastor over 22 years of being a pastor here at Calvary Chapel, I've had to do this church discipline thing, and it's never fun. It's never fun to have to discipline a brother or a sister. But I have. Not so much for sexual immorality, but for gossip and for preaching false doctrine in our children's ministry. I've had to sit brothers down. And it's interesting that, you know, once you sit them down, they don't come back. They were only here for the position or the title. They didn't really love you. Pray for them. Because they probably are going to other churches. Pray for them. And God prays. God protect us from wolves in sheep's clothing. Paul warned in Acts chapter 20, the Ephesian elders, after he departed, these people would come and try to draw people after themselves. We need to be careful. We need to be in the word so that we could know how to respond to these people. Notice fourth and lastly, the principle for the church and the principle that Paul is teaching here in these last few verses is separation. Christian separation. How, who do we separate from? How do we separate ourselves from the world or from Christian brothers that are in sin and yet calling themselves Christian? Verse 9, notice. He says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world. Or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. Since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother. Who is sexually immoral, covetous or an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, an extortioner. Not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges, and he will judge. Therefore, he says, put away from yourselves the evil person. Notice he doesn't say the kind, the, the good brother, the righteous brother. He says, what, the evil person? Because he's doing himself harm and the church by defiling it. And so notice he begins how we deal with the people in the world that are sinning. Paul says, hey, you can't separate yourself from them. You'd have to go on another planet. Is that why they're looking for another planet? To, to see if there's life on other planets? Because there's a group of churches that say, man, we got to get out of here, right? Or that's why you move to the mountains. Oh, we got to separate ourselves from this evil, polluted world. No. How do we treat the wickedness and the wicked people of the world? We love on them. That's our harvest field. We evangelize them. Listen to what Paul wrote in Philippians 2.15. He said, we should live blameless and harmless lives in the midst of a crooked and perverse world among whom we shine as lights. Hey, Jesus was called the friend of sinners and tax collectors. Why? His purpose was evangelism. His purpose was to bring them into a right relationship with God. He said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And that's our purpose. Notice, we're not to judge the world. God's going to judge them ultimately. Stop arguing with the sinners on Facebook, church. They're turning them away from the gospel. God hasn't called us to do that. He's called us to be a light and to love them. God will judge them and he'll judge them righteously in Revelation 20, verse 12 through 15, at the great white throne judgment. But Paul does say, notice, how we are to deal with unrepentant sinners. We're not to keep company with them. And the word company literally means to mix with. And that's why he says, don't eat. Why? Because in those days, they put all the food on the table, right? The hummus, and the chips and the bread and, and you dipped it or, you know, chips and salsa today. Sometimes people double dip. They didn't have those rules back then. George Costanza, Seinfeld, it wasn't an episode yet, the double dipping thing. 
And so they would just double dip. And so the same bread I pulled for, the same sauce that nourishes my body was nourishing your body. It was a sign of oneness, becoming one and, and agreeing with each other in fellowship. And that's why Paul says, don't mix. Don't even eat with them because then you're approving of their sin. And you want them to feel the conviction and the shame of their sin so that they'll turn from it. Now, we are to judge them. Why? Because we're to be fruit inspectors. We're to judge the fruit of their conversation, the conduct, the character. We're not to judge the motive. Only God knows that. But then also we put them away. As the scripture says, we don't allow them fellowship until they come repentant. Because we don't want to say that we approve of their sin. We need to call sin what it is. In order for that brother to understand that they're not going to make it to heaven in that sinful lifestyle. They need to come out of it if they want to make it. And we should be concerned about their soul. Paul had a spiritual backbone. That's true love. To ignore a brother or a sister in sin and say, yeah, let them perish. That's not love. But to confront them and say, hey, I'm concerned about you. I've heard this and this. Is it true? Hey, you need to repent. You need to confess your sin. You need to come out of that place. And it's understanding the seriousness of your sin. Let me close with this little something that I found in a book that I read by J. Edwin Orr called Fool Surrender. If you're like me, you know, there's constant surrender in your life that needs to be done every day, sometimes every hour, every week, every year. And especially as we approach this new year, we need to make sure that we're allowing the Holy Spirit to search our hearts for anything in our lives that doesn't please the Lord. And so I love this poem. It reads like this, and we'll close with this. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. I pray thee, Lord, to cleanse me now from sin. Fulfill thy promise. Make me pure within. Fill me with fire where once I burned with shame. Grant my desire to magnify thy name. Lord, take my life and make it all thine own. I want to spend it serving thee alone. Take all my will, my passion, self, and pride. I now surrender. Lord, in me abide. O Holy Ghost, revival comes from thee. Send a revival. Start the work in me. Thy word declares thou wilt supply our need. For blessing now, O Lord, I humbly plead. Let's pray. Father, we do plead for your blessing upon our life. We do invite, Lord, your Holy Spirit to search us and to ransack our hearts, Lord, turn it over our lives, the things that we allowed into our minds, the things that we've allowed our eyes to see, our heart to adore. Father, if it doesn't please you, if it's sin, if it's a weight that's holding us back from being used and being a blessing to others and being an, an example of Christ to others, Lord, we want to lay it at the altar this morning. We want to renounce the hidden shame of whatever sin, whatever weight that we've allowed to enter into our life, Father, as we approach this year, as we approach this new week, Lord. We want to surrender afresh to the work and to the person of the Holy Spirit. Father, forgive us for quenching and putting out the fire of the Spirit in our life. Forgive us, Lord, for grieving the Holy Spirit. We want to please and not grieve the Holy Spirit of God that you've given to us, our teacher, our guide. We ask, Lord, that you would pour out your blessing upon this church as we seek 
your will as we desire your direction, your counsel, and your guidance for this new year, Lord. May it be a bountiful year, a blessed year. Father, may we be bursting at the seams in this place because there's a, a love for your word here and a love for the fellowship and the unity of the spirit here and a hatred for sin and a love for souls, Lord God, because we know that time is short, because we know that you could come back at any moment and we want to be ready and we want to be telling others, Lord, that but your time is near. Use us, Lord. In these last days, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand? We'll sing a final song. If you need prayer this morning, there's going to be men and women here from our home groups, leadership, and our, and our teams. And we'd love to pray with you if you need prayer this morning. God bless you guys.
God bless you this morning.